It's great to be here. Um, I guess I'm a, I'm a two-timer. I've been here before. Um, AIBS is one of uh, the greatest scientific societies, period, but also one of the best when it comes to supporting the kind of things that I really care about, science communication and connecting with the public. So it, it's truly an honor, and thank you all. Uh, well, this is a new talk about a new book that isn't even out yet. There's one flimsy copy, galley copy right here. Sputnik is misspelled in here, so we're not quite ready to go public. Uh, but we're, we're working on it. It'll come out in July, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a sneak preview right now. But first, a little background on, on me and why it is that I, I feel this subject is important. As you heard already, in 2005, I came out with a book called The Republican War on Science. And I like to disclose the beginning of talks. There was no conscious intention here on the part of the illustrator uh, to echo another uh, popular book's cover image. We only, <laughs> only really noticed that later. Um, the argument of the book on the left uh, sorry, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, my book had an argument. The other one was just sort of more of a, a discourse. And um, the argument was that under Bush, scientific knowledge itself was under attack on a wide variety of topic areas, global warming, stem cells, evolution, many, many others. And the ethos of the era, I think, is well captured in a quotation from the president himself, the first press conference he held following the disastrous 2004 tsunami. A reporter asked Bush, does the United States have a warning system in place for the purpose of detecting tsunamis? And the president obviously didn't have any idea the answer to this question. He was flummoxed, he hemmed and hawed, and he finally said, well, you know, I think we might be less vulnerable than other parts of the world. And then he quickly added, but I'm not a geologist, as you know. <laughs> well, so th a lot has changed, as you know. The, <laughs> the war is over. Um, the so-called reality-based community has been reinstated in Washington. They have been kind enough to bring their beards with them. Um, so you, you, can, you can see people with beards in the White House again. It's really awesome. Uh, and, and, and stem cell research, you know, all the things that, we, that we're, we were worried about in the Republican war on science. Stem cell research has been set loose. Global warming looks like it's going to be addressed. Lots of new money for science in the stimulus package and beyond. Uh, I think we all agree that if the government listens to science, it will make us more ready for the future, and that's what really matters. Uh, another way of putting it is that truthiness is out. Um, it, was, it was a great joke. It's somewhat less funny now that it doesn't describe the president any longer, um, but it's still, still a great joke. I'm here to tell you, though, don't get too comfortable. There's a long way to go when you contemplate how science is regarded and treated in the nation as a whole. Uh, to put the point differently, if we now have a scientific Washington, we still have an unscientific America. If the war on science is over, now is the time for nation building, uh, bringing the public along to ensure that that war doesn't come back raging back again. And, and of course, this is the argument of my new book, Unscientific America. That's my co-author. She's not unscientific. Um, but she's, she's helped me a lot, Cheryl Kirschenbaum, get it across the finish line. Well, what do I mean when I say we have an unscientific America? Broadly, it's that the, uh, the appreciation of science in our culture is not very good. The state of science in our culture is not particularly healthy. Uh, just an example, when you ask Americans what they've heard about science lately, I'm willing to, to guess that they would say something like the following. Science demoted Pluto, and the Large Hadron Collider is going to swallow us into a black hole. And that's really sad, but these are the, these are the um, scientific issues that I think reach the most people. And of course, they respond in kind. So, and, and you've got to give them credit um, for, for cleverness, if nothing else. So I, I own one of these. Uh, I'm, I'm pro-Pluto. Uh, but in all seriousness, I, we are in bad shape in terms of the relationship between the public and the scientific community. I'll give you just some factoids. These are a small sampling of the possible facts you could bring to bear on the relationship between science and the public. Um, but they're telling. Just 18% of Americans know a scientist personally, so for everybody else, they've got to rely on some kind of, some kind of stereotype. Um, 200 years after Darwin's birth, 46% don't believe in evolution, think the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. So that's the, the young Earth creationist near majority. Near majority. Um, the Big Bang question, less than 40% can get the true-false question right about Big Bang. Um, I don't want to emphasize the, the standard scientific illiteracy questions that, of the true-false variety too much because I don't want to leave you thinking that I believe the problem is merely a lack of knowledge. It isn't. 
it's much more complicated than just what isn't in people's heads. It's, it's, it's at least as important that scientists in our culture are not generally taken to be role models or looked up to by, by the young. You know, 44 percent of Americans, this is another survey, cannot name a scientific role model. And for those who do come up with an actual name, um, guess who their top answers are? Yeah. These are the top three um, for those who answer. And, and what you'll notice is that they're either not scientists or not alive. <laughs> and, and the problem is, of course, worsened still more by politics, the subject of my first book, which basically leaves us divided as, as a people, as a citizenry, over the very nature of reality. And if you want to know how bad it is, um, consider this, this polling data from Pew that I came across. If you are a Republican, then the higher your level of education, the less likely you are to accept scientific reality, e.g. that global warming is real and human cause. But if you are a Democrat or an independent, precisely the opposite, you're more likely to accept scientific reality. So in other words, higher education just makes people better at finding misinformation on the internet and starting to believe it and makes them better at arguing wrong things. Um, something similar, uh, you know, with one of the science politics issues is that that's really come on strong and that I've begun to write about only recently, uh, the vaccine issue. Here's, here's Dumb and Dumber. And, um, you know, again, if you look at people who, who refuse to vaccinate, uh, what you find, interestingly, in the New England Journal of Medicine, their children, the children who are unvaccinated by choice, they're more likely to be male, white, belong to households with higher income, and have a married mother with a college education. And in fact, uh, these people are self-educating about whether they should vaccinate or not. They're going to the internet, they're getting misinformation or incomplete information, and then they're using their minds. They're thinking and deciding, and we would typically call that empowerment. But it's actually not really empowerment at all. It's actually quite dangerous. Um, so so things, things aren't good for the relationship between science and the public. And, and one question to ask is, what got us to this point? We spent a lot of time on that in the book. It's really a, a complicated history, and there's no one cause that you can point to. Um, but I will say I believe there has been a broad decline of the cultural appreciation or the cultural status of science in America um, from, a, from a kind of artificial, perhaps, peak uh, in the late 1950s with Sputnik and the space race and all the rest, a time when, you know, the Congress was pouring vast amounts not only into research but into education. NASA was formed. National Science Foundation was formed. Um, and many, many other kinds of initiatives. Then, you know, our politics got a lot more complicated, a lot more contentious, and many, many things occurred. Uh, we could go over it in a lot of detail, but I do want to note that, um, you know, science couldn't survive the conflicts and upheavals of the 60s, 70s um, in, in the same way, just like any more than any other part of America could. Um, and as it sort of fell out of this, this cultural uh, standing that it once had, uh, I will also note that the scientific community um, didn't always necessarily see what was happening, and you can't blame them. Um, and, but they also didn't necessarily take steps to counter it. And, and here's just one moment that really has always bothered me, um, the snubbing of Carl Sagan in 92. Uh, hands down the greatest science communicator in a generation, actually on the cover of Time magazine, just before Reagan got elected, uh, right there. He was coming on strong at that very moment in late 1980. Um, Sagan reached people through television, not just through print. Um, so he was on Johnny Carson, Cosmos, Contact, um, all of you probably know this. Uh, but he managed to win the Pulitzer, sell millions of books too, did some science. Um, nevertheless, uh, we all know the story. No one knows exactly what happened except those who were in the room because it's not public information. Um, but some of Sagan's biographies report on, um, you know, some people talking about what happened. And anyway, uh, some, some scientists who are members of the National Academies and enough scientists um, to prevent him from becoming a member uh, did so. And it had something to do, uh, we think, with, with disdain of popularization. Not every scientist felt this way, but enough did uh, that Sagan could be snubbed. Um, the core of our problem, I think, is related to this dynamic. And I, I would frame it differently. And I'd like to bring you back almost exactly 50 years to an argument that I think has incredible relevance today, although you've got to do a little bit of updating and you've got to move it across the Atlantic because it was originally made in Britain. Um, but this is the argument of C.P. Snow, that there's, you know, two different kinds of intellectual mindsets. A, a dichotomizing argument, he fully admitted that it was more complicated, but he nevertheless argued that he was grasping something, something true and essential, and I probably agree with that, and that the literary mindset and the, the scientific mindset 
were different and hard to reconcile. And at his time in Britain when he was writing, um, the two groups sort of stared at each other in hostility and, and barely even talked and didn't understand one another. How would we update snow for present day America? I would postulate that we have uh, many, many different divides that take the form uh, that the, of, the, of Snow's original two cultures divide, but, but the literary intellectuals aren't the bad guys today, as, as Snow argued that they were in 1959, if only because they don't have nearly the political power that he, you know, they're not running the country or anything close to it. Um, but you do find science divided in a kind of two cultures format from many other influential sectors of society today that are really influential and are really important. And I'd like to run through um, you know, if I can multiply the two cultures dichotomy by four, I want to run through science versus politics, science versus media, science versus entertainment, and science versus religion. I think these are the most important divides. That's not to suggest that there aren't any others. I just blogged about science versus the law. Um, but, but let's go on to science and politics, and we heard a, a good sampling of some of the kinds of issues from Bill Foster at lunch. Um, but basically, the divide I already knew, um, politicians misuse information all the time. That was the point of the Republican war on science. Um, but it's not just cherry-picking data and using it to try to achieve the political end that you wanted to achieve anyway. Um, politicians are, are often afraid of science. This is something I learned in the 2008 election when a number of us formed an organization called Science Debate 2008. I'm sure many people here signed on. And um, we thought this was a great idea, and, and scientists across the country thought it was a great idea. We got something like uh, 35,000 individual sign-ups. We got endorsements from many major institutions of science, many universities, many university presidents, down the list. Um, the number of luminaries and important people who endorsed this was staggering and, and maybe unprecedented. And we were feeling pretty high on it because the premise was just real simple. More information, more public enlightenment. If the, if the candidates will just talk about their science policies, we'll have a better election and we'll know obviously more about what they're gonna do when they're put into power. So this was the simple statement, you know, we just calling for debate. How can anyone oppose a debate? Well, the candidates didn't think this was such a great idea. Um, and again, we don't have on the record statements from them about why they were afraid to go before national television and talk about science policy. Uh, but you can maybe conjecture what some of the reasons might be. Hugely high stakes for them if they make some sort of scientific error, they could have a, a Dan Quayle moment. But you know, what do they gain? And they didn't necessarily feel uh, that being able to discuss scientific matters uh, on national television was gonna win them votes in a way that would make them uh, get ahead. So a lot of risk, not much reward. I think that was, um, broadly speaking, the political community's view of the matter. And that's, that's a two cultures divide right there. Um, the, the point is we don't have many elected representatives who think about science in the way that the scientific community does. Thank goodness we have some. We have Bill Foster. We have uh, Rush Holt, my, my own congressman uh, in Princeton now, whose motto, you see these on cars, is my congressman is a rocket scientist. But that's the exception, that's not the rule. And we could go into a lot more detail of why it is that politicians and scientists view the world very differently, but I think that is a very real difference, and I think it's a difference that hampers us. But let's go on to scientists and journalists, because they also view the world very differently. And I won't give you all of the different ways in which they view the world differently, but certainly journalists are much more inclined to adopt a balanced framework in their stories, and scientists are much more inclined to tear up the, the story if they see it framed that way. Um, and there are many, many other reasons to be concerned about the different mindsets that animate journalists and scientists. But even more important than that today is the fact that journalists who understand science are basically an endangered species. And so, you know, here's Rick Weiss, formerly of the Washington Post. He departed um, basically because he was unhappy with the, uh, the way that science was being treated there. Um, but if you go throughout the media, what you see is declining attention to science in the traditional news organizations. Um, this is a Pew data. If you watch five hours of cable news, you see you can expect to see about one minute devoted to science and technology. Newspaper specialized science sections have been dying uh, for you know almost 20 years. This is Shorenstein data only through 2005, a decline of two-thirds roughly in the number of newspaper science sections. And of course, since then, it's only continued. The Washington Post killed it in 2008. I think they've since uh, brought it back, at least temporarily, but this is what made Weiss so unhappy. T CNN dumped the science unit also in 2008. Earlier this year, Boston Globe cut the science page. This is the way things are going. Um, specialized science journalists, those least likely to make mistakes or you know, opt for the balanced story framework when it isn't 
uh, merited because they know something about the scientific community and they've been on the beat, um, they are going the way of the dinosaur along with a lot of other kinds of journalistic specialists um, because that's, that's the way the media is, is trending for broad economic and technological reasons that are going to be very difficult to stop. And so the next question is, well, what about the Internet? Isn't it going to be salvation? Well, here I was telling people at lunch, you know, I've become a curmudgeon. I'm 31 years old, but if you see my shadow, I've got a cane. And, <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I'm actually not as high on the web as I once was. And I'm a blogger, and I probably will be for the rest of my life. But I've also come to question uh, whether science communication via the Internet will ever give us a cosmos will ever give us anything that unifies the American public behind science, anything that ever reaches everybody and inspires everybody. I don't know if it's possible. Uh, and I also don't know if I like what, what, what you do get on the Internet. I think it's great um, for science, but it's also just as good for bad science and misinformation. As I, I mentioned before, the anti-vaccinationists have drawn incredible momentum um, from their ability to network over the Internet. If you go to the, you know, the opposite of the scientific community on any topic, whether it's climate or evolution or whatever else, you'll find that they've got their very, very popular websites just like we do. And it's not, it's not clear whether one is winning out or not. In fact, you know, the 2008 Best Science Blog Award, did anybody vote in that competition here? We got one. So, no, two? Okay. You, you, maybe you remember what happened. It went down to the wire, and down to the wire between a blog that supports, broadly supports science, but really is popular for bashing religion, and that's Feringula, and PZ Myers, and then on the other hand, what's up with that, which is popular because it bashes climate science. And so they were neck and neck. None of the other blogs were even close. And in the end, the anti-global warming blog was the most popular one on the Internet, uh, among science blogs anyway. So the, so the problem with science blogs, right, is that people go and find information they're interested in. And there's some people interested in science. There's some people interested in any science. And they go and read and they get fired up um, among a small selection of the public that thinks roughly in the way that they do. Um, but you're not, you're not getting all of America, or even close, and you're not getting them necessarily with positive messages about science. Rather, you're fragmenting, uh, in many cases, the audience. So that's not to say that the, the Internet is bad. I mean, I refuse to Twitter. That's never, never happening for me. Um, but there are good things. But I just, don't, I just don't know if we're replacing what's being lost in the old media, and I'm very concerned about that. So that's, that's the, the science news media divide. Well, but what is the most influential slice of the media at all? Uh, uh, overall, it's not the news media, right? It's actually the entertainment media. How is science faring here? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm behind. This is my joke about how I started worrying and learned to question the blog. Science and the entertainment media. Um, it's not necessarily any salvation either. I, I hear there's a trend towards more science in Hollywood, but nevertheless, you have to worry about scientists constantly being depicted as freaks, geeks, or villains. Um, you know, constant recurrence of the paranormal narrative. You know, there's a skeptical scientist character who says, no way, you know, there's no monster. The monster's standing right behind them, you know, the whole time. Scooby-Doo is pretty much the only story that, that turns it on its head and it's still the best. Um, and then you just have sort of the, the ridiculous science uh, of Hollywood. Let's run through a couple of examples. Oh, sorry, here are some more nerds. that we could, we could find many, many images of those. The science of the day after tomorrow, right? Global warming leads to a new ice age. World is attacked by massive freezing upside down hurricanes that travel over land, but the characters survive by burning books <laughs> in the New York Library. Uh, the Science of the Core, I believe this was voted like the worst science movie of all time or something like that. It deserved it. Uh, microwaves could not destroy the Golden Gate Bridge, but you know, if the planet's core stopped turning, the microwaves would be the least of our concerns anyway. Uh, but luckily, well, not luckily, but in any event, the, the characters make their journey to the center of the earth using a material called unobtainium. <laughs> and just one more. This one is actually the worst that I've seen, and we played back the video many times to confirm the information that I'm about to share with you, just to make sure that they actually did do this, and they did. Red Planet, Val Kilmer, pretty bad movie. But um, they've got a geneticist character played by Tom Sizemore, and he gives one of these science speeches that you get in most Hollywood sci-fi kind of movies in which it's techno banter, and it identifies that this is the nerd character, and they're saying something that you can't understand. And so his, his speech is about genetics, and he says, I'm a geneticist. I study A, G, T, and P. <laughs> and, you know, I guess they never saw Gattaca. 
And then there's the last divide that I'll, that I'll just talk briefly about. And maybe, maybe the most important, and certainly the one where there's the most sort of sound and fury signifying nothing, science versus religion. Here's Richard Dawkins in South Park. Nobody wants to sit with him. He's too mean. Uh, again, it's a, it's a two cultures divide between scientists and the rest of America. You've got 50% of top scientists at top institutions claiming no religious affiliation versus just 14% of the public or 14% of the public describing as evangelical or fundamentalist versus less than 2% of scientists. You know, forget who's right or wrong. There are two communities that don't think in the same way, that share very different assumptions, and those assumptions make it very hard for them to have productive dialogue. And it's even harder when the middle is polarized by the extremes. So on the one hand, you've got the new atheists attacking religion on behalf of science. On the other hand, you have you know, the intelligent design creationists and all the rest attacking science on behalf of religion. And for the average person on the street, what is the message? Science versus religion, war, war, war. You can't have both. You've got to have one or the other. And a lot of them, if forced into a choice, I don't know that they will choose science. Why do we have to do something about these divides? I think it's obvious to everyone in this room, but um, the thing that matters most to me is the future. Uh, I believe that a lot of science policy, politics, crack-ups, you know, sort of the generation two after global warming and stem cells, the next battles, um, there are many of them coming, and that's just because science keeps changing the world, and so there are inevitably going to be controversies relating to science. And if we don't understand it, don't appreciate it, then we will not be ready for the big policy decisions that have a scientific component that are coming. Do I know what all of them are? No. I can sort of... I can guess a couple, I may be wrong, um, but I've written about geoengineering, the idea that you know, if we can't get global warming to slow down through some of the, the policy solutions that are currently on the table, we might just have to go a little further and remake the planet, bombard the stratosphere with um, reflective particles, which, which I'm told we could probably do um, for something like a billion dollars, and, and just throw the switch and try to cool things down. There'll be a huge public battle if that, if that ever becomes a viable alternative, but most, of, most people have never even heard of the idea of geoengineering. Uh, what about synthetic minimal genome organisms? Again, people are probably going to be very weirded out by the idea that we're creating life and then releasing it into nature. But uh, I understand the scientific community is getting pretty close to this, and again, most Americans don't even know that such a thing is going on. Um, this, is, this, is a rep, uh, this is a recipe for big conflicts a recipe for unhappy surprises for many Americans. And, and that those are just two possible issues where this may occur, and I can't, I can't obviously predict the future. Well, what can we do? And I'll end uh, with, uh, with some comments on this. Scientists, it seems to me, have always relied, or at least in modern America, they have relied on two key surrogates whose job it is to reach the public for them. Uh, those surrogates are the educators on the one hand and the journalists on the other. I haven't said much in this talk about education because it's a huge topic and a dismaying one and obviously very important to the picture here. But suffice it to say, science education in America is not what it ought to be. Um, I don't know if we're blaming the educators, but certainly we're saying that, that science education has not gotten us where we would hope to be. And similarly with the journalists, the science evangelists in the media, they're losing their jobs. Um, so we can't necessarily rely on either of these surrogates right now to solve the kind of problems that I'm talking about. In fact, maybe, maybe the whole idea that the public is the problem here is the problem. And I'd like to turn that on its head briefly. There's this idea, it's called the deficit model um, by science and technology study scholars. And, and the definition is um, the notion that the blame for problems at the intersection between science and society is lies with the public, which doesn't understand enough science. It's def deficient in some way, hence the deficit model. Uh, the scholars in the field debunk the idea, but still I think a lot of scientists, certainly not all, but a lot of them either implicitly or explicitly do subscribe to something like the deficit model. And um, you can see one explicitly subscribing to it in this great documentary, Flock of Dodos by Randy Olson, where the, the subject of evolution comes up and a scientist says, um, how do you, you know, the question is, how do you respond, how do you talk to anti-evolutionists, intelligent design people, and one of the scientists says, I think you have to stand up and say, you're an idiot. Well, I think we have to not, not fall into that temptation. The problem with it is, I'm not saying that there isn't blame in a lot of quarters. I'm not saying politicians are innocent. Obviously, I wrote a whole book attacking them for misusing science. I'm not saying that journalists are innocent. 
I'm not saying that entertainers are innocent. I'm not saying that religious leaders are innocent. And I'm not saying the public is well informed. But I am saying that the deficit model has the effect of exonerating that last party in the equation, the scientific community, and making it too easy for them to blame others. Um, whereas, in fact, I think everybody, everybody is to blame. Um, so maybe what we need uh, is a grand new program of public outreach from the scientific world. If the journalists aren't going to do it for us, if fixing education is a generational project and we can't wait, maybe, maybe that's what the answer is. There's been a small start in Congress, legislation by um, Rep Matsui from California, the Scientific Communications Act 2007, um, rolled into the American Competes Act. It was going to direct NSF to make grants to help grad students obtain um, communication training, but you know, Congress did its thing, and it supports this, but it will not support it with any money. It's merely a sense of Congress, so it's probably not going to happen. Uh, I'll end on, on the note by, by highlighting what I think is the bigger issue, and this is where Cheryl Kirschenbaum, a young scientist, contributed, you know, I think the most, the part of the book that I would never have been able to contribute if, uh, if I hadn't been working with her. And this is, this is focused on the scientific pipeline and how the way that we produce scientists maybe lets some of these two cultures divides continue to exist. Um, we've long heard concerns, and they're concerns that are valid, uh, that the United States might be falling behind in science, that we need to preserve our competitiveness in science. The Rising Above the Gathering Storm Report is sort of the canonical articulation of this position. And there's been some misinformation um, in relation to this broad concern. For example, you hear people say, and I'm not sure that the, National, that the Gathering Storm Report ever said it, you hear them say, you know, we're not producing as many scientists as before. Well, we actually are. Our, our PhDs are increasing, but you can still see many reasons to worry. Uh, the rate of increase, for example, in somewhere like China is greater. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the concern about competitiveness, and we're, thank goodness we're now responding to it in Washington. But what often gets left out of the picture is that we're not at the same time we're worried about being competitive with other countries, we're not creating enough opportunities at home for the talent that we currently have. Uh, the probability that a PhD recipient under 35 will obtain a tenure track job is just 75%. Um, so young scientists today cannot assume uh, that they are going to follow in the footsteps of the people who train them. That the opportunities just aren't there. Um, and the opportunities in the private sector, uh, I think, especially in this economic moment, are also challenging. So I want to end by suggesting couldn't we kill two birds with one stone if we looked at the pipeline and we tried to create new valves for young scientists who can't necessarily go all the way to the end of the pipeline, which is the tenure track position? What if they get out a little bit early if they're interested in doing so because there are new jobs for them to be uh, public outreach experts, people whose job it is to intersect with Congress, with the entertainment industry, with the religious community, with the news media? Um, and these would have to be nonprofit jobs. I'm not sure that the market would create these jobs, but I think that they ought to exist. And I think you'd find a lot of young scientists today, like my co-author Cheryl, who would love to work in this field. And if they could, I, I gave this talk in Seattle, and someone came up to me afterwards. She said, I'm, I do Toastmasters. I'd love to train scientists in public speaking, but there's no, you know, she's a grad student. There's no job for me to do this. There's no way I can go into this. I think Toastmaster skills are very valuable, and I think that they should be, um, should be spread. But, but the market doesn't create it, and the nonprofit world doesn't necessarily create it either right now. And so maybe we need to change the paradigm for science education. There will always be plenty of people doing research. Maybe we need a new army of people also doing outreach. These are some policy um, solutions I'll just read real quick, and then I'll end. Let's arm graduate-level science students with the skills to communicate the value of what science does to get better into touch with the culture. Giving them more diverse skills of this sort will only help them navigate the job market wherever they are. Let's encourage public policymakers, scientific leaders, and philanthropists who care about the place of science in the society to create a new range of nonprofit public interest fellowships and job positions to do precisely this. Let's emphasize connecting science with the sectors of society where it is currently disconnected, prioritizing politics, media, entertainment, and religion. I'd just like to close with a quotation from my good friend Matthew Chapman. He's the great, great grandson of Charles Darwin. He's a Hollywood screenwriter, and he founded Science Debate 2008, so a pretty interesting guy. And he put it like this. I'll never forget his words. Instead of being derided as geeks or nerds, scientists should be seen as courageous realists and the last great heroic explorers of the unknown. They should get more money, more publicity, better clothes, more sex, and free rehab when the fame goes to their heads. Thanks.
Oh, yes, please do. Drive up the numbers and they'll order more. Yeah. And there will be book signings right after this. Does anyone have a question? Quick question? Because they're all... Oh, here's one. Actually, a quick comment. Uh, tomorrow there's a thing on professional science masters, which one of its goals is to teach scientists to be business people, communicators, and the like. And communication is one of the important skills that are taught mm -hmm. in those programs. Oh, yeah, and I don't mean to suggest that, actually, I think this is a new trend starting now. I think that it's growing. I don't think it, I think we need it to grow a lot. But, but there's, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of innovation starting right now. And I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing a little training myself out at Scripps in, um, in August. So, so it, it, it's starting, but we need, I think, a great deal more.